Amen. I'll invite you to turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. The story that we're pulling the verse out of our uh, text scripture tonight from is when Peter was in a certain place and went up on the housetop to pray, waiting for a meal to be prepared. He had a vision. Actually, he had three visions, the same one three times. He saw a sheep held by the corners, let down from heaven, and it had all manner of beasts in it, clean and unclean. And there was a voice that says, Rise, Peter, slay and eat. And Peter rejected it. He said, Not so, Lord. Now, he must have known it was from the Lord. Because he said, Not so, Lord. I've never eaten anything unclean in my life. And it happened again, same thing. Peter responded the same way. It happened again the third time. Peter responded the same way. And then the vision ended. And it says that while Peter thought on the vision, he didn't know what it meant. But while Peter thought on the vision, the Holy Ghost said to him, three men are downstairs looking for you. Go with them without asking any questions. Now, the three men had been sent from Cornelius' house. Cornelius was a centurion. He was a captain in the um, Roman army. And he had a hundred soldiers under him. And he had been praying and there was an angel the day before he had been praying. And an angel appeared to him and told him about how to find Peter who would preach the word to them so that he and his household could be saved. Well, he sent these three guys. When these three guys got there, Peter, after having been instructed by the Holy Ghost to go with them and not ask any questions, Apparently, the journey was too far for him to get to or finish in that day. So the next day, they went to Cornelius' household. Cornelius told him the story about how he had seen the angel, and the angel sent instructions or gave him instructions to send for Peter. And so then Peter starts telling about Jesus. He's finally convinced, even though these are Gentiles that he's with, and he's certainly going to get called on the carpet and get in trouble for that. It took the, the church some period of time, several years. Actually, Acts chapter 10 is identified or, or suspected to be about 10 years after the day of Pentecost where the Holy Ghost was poured out. And even then, there had been smattering incidents, isolated events where the Gentiles were preached to. But by and large, the church in Jerusalem still thought that it was supposed to be to the Jews and the Jews exclusively or almost exclusively at least so when peter is preaching to these gentiles he tells them about things that he witnessed when he was with jesus working with jesus in his earthly ministry and one of the things that he says about jesus and and he's apparently he's trying to just give them a summary of the things that he witnessed in acts chapter 10 verse 38 peter tells cornelius in his household the packed house how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. Now folks, that verse of scripture is packed with information. It's real easy just to read over it and say, well, Jesus or Peter is just casually telling about Jesus. But there are specifics in this verse of scripture. There are specifics that are so important that Luke, the author of the book of Acts, was directed by the Holy Ghost to save and to, and to tell us about. The Holy Ghost preserved these manuscripts, these truths, and they are so important for us. The information contained in this is so important for us that I, I, I don't think I'm overstating the case. You judge it for yourself. But these truths are so important that even now it... This scripture being received and understood and believed can change the life of somebody drastically, turn things completely around. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. In the late 1800s, John Alexander Dowie was a Scottish minister, and the city that he lived in and pastored a church in, along with the region about around that city, was besieged by a plague. Now, I don't know if they ever identified what the plague was. Maybe it was the Black Plague. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it was something else. I never saw any, any reports on what type of plague it was. 
but it was devastating the city and the surrounding regions. He had buried 40 of his own church members, and he was just coming back from having been at the hospital and watching some other of his church members die. The hospitals were overflowing. They had to set up tents, makeshift hospitals out in the streets. And it just looked like there was no answer for this. And it looked like it was going to wipe out everybody in the city. So Dowie went back to his home after having made this hospital visit. And he sat in his home and he began to cry out to God and he just said, Lord, is, my, is everybody in my church going to die? And the Holy Ghost spoke these words to him. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Dowie was familiar with the scripture. He was familiar with the source of the scripture, where it was found in the book of Acts. And in a moment of time, the Holy Ghost opened his eyes to the truth. Now here's the truth that his eyes were opened unto. Jesus of Nazareth was anointed with the Holy Ghost in power to do good and heal. Dowie said, instantly I saw that sickness is always of the devil. Everybody Jesus healed was oppressed of the devil in his earthly ministry, according to Peter. And he was there for all of them that took place. He should know. Dowie said, instantly I saw that sickness is of the devil and the healing power of God is a part of his goodness that has been shown unto mankind. Well, that set him on a mission. From that moment forward, there was not another church member, another member of his congregation that contracted the plague, and those that were in the hospital that had already contracted the pr plague came through it without dying. There was not another person that was lost. Because of one scripture, because of one scripture and the truth that it contained, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth well, if God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with healing power and with a mandate to do good, then it must be that God's will for people to be healed so that good can be done. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost in power who went about doing good. I'm sure that the Holy Ghost in Peter's day knew the, the arguments that would be made against divine healing in our day and in every other generation. You've got some people saying that God uses sickness and disease to teach you something and the lessons that we are to learn are good so God uses sickness to bring us into that goodness of God well of all the people that I've ever heard of or talked to personally that believe God had brought sickness upon them for some purpose to teach them or for them to learn something I've never seen any of them glad that it was going on I've never seen anybody for example, say, this is for my benefit, so Lord, double up. Everybody I've ever seen that claims that God is trying to teach them something is trying to get out of it and get healed. Well, if it was God's will for them to be sick, wouldn't that be counterproductive? Wouldn't that be an act of sin on their own part to try to get away from what they think is God's work? Folks, nobody wants to be sick. Nobody that's ever been sick have been able to identify some benefit that the sickness in itself caused or brought them to. Satan is the oppressor. Satan is the oppressor. And God is the one that d does good through Jesus to bring about our healing through his divine power. Now with that said, turn back with me to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13, while you're turning there, let me make some other comments. Of all the healing ministers that have written books and, and brought us to information of how God used them in their ministry, like, for example, the book Christ the Healer by F.F. F. Bosworth. Another example is Healing the Sick by T.L. Osborne. Both of those books are classics where it comes to healing and the subject of healing is concerned. And these men, those two men, Brother Osborne and F.F. F. Bosworth, 
both identified, as well as many other healing evangelists and healing ministers have done over the years, that the number one hindrance to people being healed is they're not convinced it's God's will for them to be healed. Well, if you're not convinced that it's God's will for you to be healed, then that certainly lends itself to the notion that they must have that maybe God's at work in this thing somehow or some way. But in both cases, with Brother Osborne and Brother Bosworth, they both identified that preaching, healing all over the world, F.F. Bosworth's ministry was mostly in America, T.L. Osborne went everywhere there is to go. Both of them have identified that if you can show people in a clear and concise way that it's God's will for them to be healed, then receiving their healing is the easiest thing in the world. Easiest thing in the world. Brother Osborne, T.L. Osborne, was at one time an Assembly of God minister and he was invited later on in his ministry. He didn't stay associated with him or affiliated with the organization throughout the whole of his ministry. But there was a time when he was there. He was part of them. And the reports were coming back from overseas of the, the tremendous meetings and healings and miracles that were taking place in his campaigns or crusades or whatever you want to call them. And so they had a, a, a workshop they, meaning the Assembly of God at their convention, they had an afternoon workshop, and they turned it into a question and answer session. It was a special thing for them to get Brother Osborne. I'm not sure he was even part of their organization at the time that, that uh, these events took place that we're talking about. But he agreed to be a part of the panel that they were holding, and so they had ministers from all over the country that were there as a part of this convention and they had advertised it ahead of time that T.L. Osborne was there. He's going to be one of the keynote speakers. And then he was going to do the question and answer thing in the afternoon. And so it was a packed house. There wasn't an empty seat anywhere. Hundreds of people. Actually in the thousands of people. Not sure how big it was, but they got the biggest room they could hold it in. And the questions, everybody wanted to know, wanted to ask Brother Osborne questions the other people on the panel weren't even asked anything. And the big question was, how is it that you, talking to Brother Osborne, how is it that you, T.L. Osborne, are able to go into foreign countries and have such tremendous success and have the healings and the miracles and the people getting saved by the tens of thousands in your crusades and campaigns? They went on to say, we've got other famous ministers that are a part of the Assembly of God organization or denomination, and they don't get the same results you do. What's your secret? And he kind of laughed and said, well, it's real simple. He said, if I can get to a country before you do, I can have miracles. Nobody understood what he was talking about, so he explained. He said, when I go into a country that hadn't had any evangelization take place there whatsoever, he said, it's a very simple thing for me to just proclaim Jesus as the healer and see people healed by the multitudes. And as a result of seeing the healings and the miracles, everybody's willing to, to serve a God that'll do good things like that. So that's why I get those kind of results. But then he said, on the other side, if I go into a country where you guys have already been, and even though you say in your charter and it's still in the Assembly of God Charter, that Jesus is the healer. Even though that's part of your foundational beliefs, if you start telling people that God sometimes makes people sick, or that God uses sickness in some way or another, he said, by the time I get there, they've already been indoctrinated with unbelief, and I can't get any healing miracles or results. Now, you can well imagine the impact that had on the organization. But he simply told it the way it was. Now with Brother Dowie, that one revelation, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost in power, who went about doing good and healing. Thank God healing is good. If healing is ever good, healing has to always be good. Who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Folks, when we understand that basic foundational truth, that revelation, that he received in a moment of time that God always heals, 
because it's his will to do good, that sickness is always of the devil. Just that simple foundational truth can put you ahead in life in ways that are hard to explain. Now, with that in mind, let's look at the attitude of God and the attitude of Jesus in certain healing situations or healing events. Luke chapter 13, verse 10, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bound together and could in no wise lift up herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loose from thine infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day. And he said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to work, and them therefore come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. The Lord then answered him and said, Thou hypocrite, does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? And ought not this woman, I love this verse of Scripture, here's God's attitude towards sickness and disease. Now remember God said of himself, I'm God, I change not. Remember the Bible says that God is no respecter of persons. That means what he's willing to do for one, he's willing to do for all. It doesn't mean that we all have the same calling on our life, but it means we all have the same things in Jesus. Nobody's got more of Jesus than the rest of us. Ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, lo, these 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? Jesus gives two reasons why the woman ought to be loosed. Two reasons. The first is she's a daughter of Abraham which tells us conclusively, no wiggle room on this one, folks. It identifies specifically and, and completely that healing had to be a part of the Abrahamic covenant. I'll remind you of Galatians chapter 3, verse 29. It says, and if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. If you're in Christ, if you've made Jesus the Lord of your life, then you ought to be healed just as much as this woman. You have the same promise. You have the same blessing of healing. And so God's attitude toward you would be the same as his attitude toward this woman. You ought to be healed because it's a part of the Abrahamic covenant that Jesus has fulfilled. The second thing he says, Ought not this woman be loose from this bond on the Sabbath day because Satan has kept her bound 18 years? Folks, God wants you healed more than you want to be healed. God wants you well more than you want to be well. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to be healed and well. Who wouldn't want that? What person on the face of the earth wouldn't want that? God wants it more than you do. God doesn't want any of his children, you, me, or anybody else, to be held in bondage by the devil. God's not working hand in hand with his mortal enemy. He's not using the devil's supplies or methods to try to teach or instruct his people. The Bible says God instructs us with his word, and that's the only way that it ever tells us that he tries to teach us. God doesn't use circumstances to teach you. Now, certainly there are tests. Certainly there are times where the devil will resist what we know the Bible says belongs to us and our taking hold of that by faith. And so there are fights of faith. But that's not a matter of God using sickness and disease. If we find ourselves in a situation where we're in bondage to the enemy, there may be a fight of faith or a standing on God's word for a period of time to reap the benefits and reap the rewards. But God's always on the winning side. Ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound low these 18 years, shouldn't she be well? Shouldn't she be healed? When my kids were little, and the devil would try to put something on them, whether it's cold, flu, that kind of stuff, symptoms or whatever, it would make me madder than anything else in the world. 
Now, I didn't, I didn't necessarily get mad like that when the devil tried to bring it against me because I knew what I had. I knew what belonged to me. I knew that I could simply take hold in faith what was mine. But when my kids were attacked, I went nose to nose with the devil until things changed. Now, if, I, I think that's part of being a good father. If I'm delusional, don't try to set me straight. I'm happy where I am. But if that is a, a mark of being a good father, how much more would God want the same thing with us? How much more would sickness and disease attaching itself to our bodies frustrate the Lord just like it frustrates us as parents? God wants you well. And he made provisions for you to walk in divine health. He made provisions for you through the blood of Jesus to take hold of the healing that he accomplished, that Jesus accomplished through his own sacrifice. He doesn't want you and I sick for one moment. Now, again, there are fights of faith. There are times where I have to stand in faith, no matter what the circumstances. But in the final analysis, those are just short-term things, no matter how long it is. Those are just short-term things measured against eternity. And without question, we can find God's faithfulness to deliver us and to bring us out of situations where the devil has tried to put us in bondage or keep us in bondage. But we come out on the other side recognizing God's faithfulness, knowing that if he did it once, he'll do it again. Now turn with me to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. Beginning in verse 1, it says, When Jesus was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there came a leper that worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. I would submit to you that the modern day church person has that switched around. Most in the church today would say, we believe God can heal us, but we're not sure if it's his will. Now, of all the people that Jesus ministered to in his earthly ministry, this is the only example we've got of anybody questioning his will. The only one. That's the majority position for most of the people in the church world today. You'd be hard-pressed to find a Christian that doesn't believe God can do anything. The Bible says that all things are possible with God. So very few people will take sides against that and say that God can't heal the sick. Well, if he can heal the sick, why doesn't he heal the sick? Well, in most cases, it comes down to some form of the individual who has been attacked with sickness and disease, whose body's been attacked being unsure of the will of God, just like this guy was. Now, notice what Jesus does in response to this. And again, folks, God doesn't change. So whatever Jesus' response is to this guy, being unsure of the will of God to heal, even though he believes he has the power to do so, that's going to have to be the same response that God would have today when faced with somebody that questions his will. Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Luke's account of this, I, I believe it is, says that Jesus was moved with compassion. He instantly moved forward, motivated by compassion. Now, folks, if God had, if Jesus had compassion on this leper, but he doesn't have compassion on you or me, when we go to him for help, then God is a respecter of persons. And if just one claim, one scripture, one foundational point that the Bible tells us about our Heavenly Father, if just one of them is untrue, the whole foundation comes apart. God can't be a respecter of persons. He says that he's not. And for his, his word to be truth and not a, uh, to be truth instead of being a lie, then that has to stand forever. I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. I think most of the time we look at that story and we get caught by the immediately. Everybody wants instant results. I do. Don't you? Instant results don't always come though. And that's the whole crux of the, the fight of faith. That's the whole point. 
for maintaining our confession, holding fast to our profession of faith, continuing to speak the word, because things don't always happen overnight. And so we need to be prepared for the long haul. If it is a long haul, we need to be ready for it. If we're prepared for a long haul and it turns out to be a short haul, all the better. Now, folks, I want you to notice something that both of these two verses of Scripture, or two passages of Scripture, Luke 13 and Matthew 8, I want you to notice something in common. Jesus didn't check their backgrounds. He didn't question them about sin in their lives. He didn't raise one single doubt about whether they were worthy to be healed. Not one. Not one. Turn with me to John chapter 9. John chapter 9. I know you know these scriptures. I know you heard us preach and teach on them for many years. But I got to tell you, folks, there are times where these stories affect me like it's the first time I've ever read them. It's like an old friend. Certain healing examples and the stories of the healings that took place in Jesus' ministry. If I get away from them for a while, when I come back to them, it's like me meeting an old friend once again. Thank God his word is true. And thank God his word is alive. It's full of life and power, he said. Verse 1, and as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, I want you to realize something, folks. The disciples, after having been with Jesus for whatever period of time they've been with him at this point, they understand something. They understand something. And the church certainly should know more than they knew, especially when they were just on, uh, walking with Jesus in the ministry. Because we now have the Holy Ghost within us. They didn't. But because Jesus has finished his work on the cross, we've got the Holy Ghost. We've got the teacher on the inside of us. We should be further along than where they were. And since the Bible is progressive revelation, we should be learning more and more than they knew. This story was explained to me in Sunday school I remember the teaching very specifically. I don't remember it happening but once. But I remember that the teaching was that God made this man blind so Jesus would have somebody to heal. And they used verse 3 as the, the, the foundation for that. Jesus answered and said, Neither is this man sin nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Now I want you to notice the punctuation there. The punctuation was added by the translators. If you go back to the original text of the New Testament Greek, there is no punctuation. It's all what we would consider to be upper caps. No uppercase and lowercase, all uppercase. And so the, the translators were left, no chapter and verse divisions, just one giant run on sentence. And so the translators were left to decipher what the Word of God was revealing to us. And for the most part, 99% of the time, they did a fantastic job. But part of the translation is not just their knowledge of the, of the language. But every translation is going to be only as good as the translator's knowledge of the language and their understanding of the character and the nature of God. Clearly these translators thought that God made people sick as well as healed them, which is impossible. God's either the healer or he's the one that maketh you sick. Which one is he? The disciples understood something that most of the church world doesn't know, and that is they understood that sin was the source of sickness and disease. Their question is we don't know if it's their personal sin. We don't know if the man sinned. We don't know if the parent sinned. But sin is the root cause. The Bible identifies that very plainly. Romans chapter 5 verse 12. Wherefore as by one man sin entered the world and death passed upon all men. For all have sinned in Adam. 
So we see that sin, the original sin, was the source of sickness and disease coming into the earth. The disciples understood that sin was the cause, but they didn't know whose sin it was. So Jesus answers, neither is this man sin nor his parents. Now, if, that, if you'll notice, folks, the first thing Jesus does is answer their question. Who sinned, the man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answers the question, neither is this man sin nor his parents, period. That's the end of, the, of his answer. But then he goes to explain what he was sent to do. Then he says, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him, I must work the works of him that sent me while it's day. The night comes when no man can work. Jesus is not talking about sin anymore. He's talking about what God sent him to do. He says, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him, I must work the works of him that sent me. Now, what work did Jesus bring? What did he do? He healed the guy. He spit on the ground, made clay of the spittle, told him to go wash off in the pool of Siloam. And the man came again seeing. So the works of God had to be healing. Not making him sick or making him blind. The works of God that Jesus said that he must do, that he did, was healing the blind's eyes. Healing the blind's eyes. Well, if sin is the problem... But it wasn't the individual sin and it wasn't the parent's sin. Whose sin caused the problem? Adam and Eve's. The original sin in the Garden of Eden opened the door to sickness and disease. And folks, the devil is an equal opportunity to destroy her. He'll destroy the unsaved just like he'll destroy the saved. He'll destroy the children of God just like he'll destroy the children of the devil. He doesn't care. His purpose is to kill, steal, and to destroy. But Jesus clearly identifies the contrast between sin, which caused the man to be born in the first place. Jesus clearly says it's not his sin, it's not the parent's sin, so it has to be Adam's sin. Nobody else would have anything to do with this guy and, and whether he was blind or not. And then Jesus says, I was sent to do a work. God sent me to do certain works. Well, what's the work that he did here? He brought sight to the blind. I must work the works of him that sent me while it's day. The night comes when no man can work. As long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. So why was this man born blind? Because sin, sickness entered the world through sin. Why did Jesus heal him? Because God sent him to heal all that were oppressed of the devil. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. How could God be with him if he was ever operating contrary to the will of God? See, folks, if God ever wanted anybody to be healed, or I'm sorry, if God ever brought sickness upon anybody and Jesus healed them, then Jesus has to be working contrary to the, to the plan and purpose and will of God. Because if God never changes, if God ever wanted somebody to be sick, he will always want people to be sick. There's no playing both sides of the street here. It's one way or the other. Either he's making people sick or he's healing them. Jesus said he was sent to heal. Neither is this man sin nor his parents. But that the works of God should be made manifest in him I must work the works of him that sent me while it's day. Now, folks, I would suggest to you that if the translators added the punctuation to the text, based on their knowledge of the language and their understanding of God, if we have a greater understanding of God, then we have just as much a right to put the punctuation where we think it should go as they did. Their question, who sinned, this man or his parents? Jesus answered, neither is this man's sin nor his parents, period. Next sentence. But that the works of God should be made manifest in him, comma, I must work the works of him that sent me. Now, folks, I've got to tell you, this error in punctuation has caused a lot of people to question whether or not God wants them to be well. It's things like this 
that the devil will use to twist and turn people's thinking to keep them from taking hold of the very thing Jesus was sent for us to have. But that I might work the works of him that sent me, I must work while it's day. Again, we know what his works were. He healed the guy. Let's keep reading. Verse 6, when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And Jesus said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. And he went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. The neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him that was blind, said, Is, th is this not him that sat and begged? And some said, This is he. But others said, Well, he's like him. But he said, I am he. There was a question, Are you the guy? He answers, Yeah. Therefore they said unto him, How were I, your eyes open? He answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes, and said unto me, Go, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And when I went and washed, and I received sight. Then they said unto him, Where is he? And he said, I don't know. I was busy going to the pool of Siloam. They brought him to the Pharisees that aforetime, aforetime was blind. And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Have you noticed how many times Jesus does things on the Sabbath day to tweak these Pharisees and religious people? Jesus understood that the laws concerning the Sabbath were made to serve man, not to imprison him, not to bind him in any way. Then again, the Pharisees always also asked him how he had received his sight. He said unto them, He put clay upon my eyes, and I washed, and now I see. Then therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God, because he keeps not the Sabbath day. Others said, How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. The power of God always causes division among religious people, folks. Always. They said unto the blind man again, What sayest thou of him, that he opened your eyes? And the man answered, He's a prophet. He's got to be from God. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been born blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. And they asked him, saying, Is this your son whom you say was born blind? How then does he see? The parents answered and said, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But by what means he now see, seeth, we know not. Or we don't know who has opened his eyes. He is of age, ask him. He shall speak for himself. These words spake the parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that Jesus was the Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore said, he of his, par said his parents, he is of age, ask him. Then again they called the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. The man that was healed answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. And then they said to him again, What did he do to thee? How opened he thine eyes? He answered and said, I have told you already, and you didn't hear. Wherefore would you hear it again? Will you also become his disciples? Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spake unto Moses, As for this fellow, we don't know where he's from. The man answered and said unto them, Why, herein is a marvelous thing that you don't know from whence he is, and yet he has opened my eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he hears. Since the world began, it was not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind. Folks, this is a notable miracle. This is not just some fly-by-night thing. And what's amazing to me is that John is the only one that gives us an account of it. As significant as this was, and you can see from the surrounding detail that John writes. And remember, John wrote many, many years after the other gospels and other letters to the church were written. It's been some 60 years between Jesus being crucified and raised from the dead and John writing this letter or this gospel that bears his name. He understood the significance of it. This is one of the mighty works of Jesus throughout his whole ministry. So he says, since the world began, it was not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind. 
If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. Then answered and said unto them, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said unto him, Do you believe on the Son of God? And he answered, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. In order to believe the truth, this guy had to be cast out of the temple. Or because he believed the truth. Maybe that's a better way to say it. Jesus didn't find him in the temple. He found him in the streets. The devil will go to great lengths to argue against the power of God. Because folks, you know as well as I do that once God displays his power, there's a lot of people that won't be able to argue against it. And because of that display of power, they'll come into the family of God. The Bible says in James chapter 5 that the husband waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it till he received the early and the latter rain. That and the surrounding scriptures identify to us that Jesus is coming back. But before he comes back, there's going to be a great revival. There's going to be a great move of God. The working of the Holy Ghost is called the former and the latter rain. It indicates to us, the Bible indicates to us through the Old Testament, that the promised land was a land that needed early rain to set the seed in the ground and later rain to cause the fruit to come forth. When the Bible talks, talks about the Holy Ghost and the work of the Holy Ghost in, the, in the, the last days of the church, the end of the church age, it speaks of both the former and the latter rain. That might mean, and I don't know this for sure, but I guess we'll find out when we get there. But it's certainly possible that it means the same power that we saw in the early days of the church and more. And that's a work of the Holy Ghost. Now we see what the Holy Ghost did in the early days of the church. In Acts chapter 3 when Peter and John healed the lame man at the beautiful gate of the temple. 5,000 people get saved because of that one miracle. Well people hadn't changed. God hadn't changed and his power hasn't changed. So can you imagine what the world would look like if the Holy Ghost begins to move in different countries at the same time through healing miracles, notable miracles, just like this one is identified and just like the one in Acts chapter 3? The church world has programs, evangelism programs, and I'm not against anything. But so much of the evangelism programs of the church are done through the work of the flesh. We're tra not to say that's a bad thing. We all want to reach as many people as we can. And no matter what program or what means we use to try to reach people, if it's successful in any way whatsoever, just the smallest measure, it's worth doing. No doubt about it. But when you see God start evangelizing through a display of the power of the Holy Ghost, I wonder how quickly God could really wrap this thing up. Imagine if the church worldwide began to operate in the power of God, the healing power of God, the miracle working power of God at the same time. The Bible talks about just a small group of disciples being spoken of as turning the world upside down with just a few minor things, just a few miracles, few healings. They were turning their world upside down. I can't wait for God to help us turn ours. Finally, I want you to turn with me to Mark chapter 5. We see in each one of these stories, healing events, God's attitude toward healing the sick. His attitude toward sickness and his attitude toward healing. 
We've seen different situations where Jesus initiated, like in Luke chapter 13. It doesn't identify that the woman came to be healed. Jesus simply sees her, has compassion on her, recognizes she's the daughter of Abraham, and she's being oppressed of the devil. So he lays hands on her, and she's made straight. The leper in Matthew chapter 8, he believed that, God, that Jesus could, by the power of God, heal him of leprosy, but he didn't know if he was willing to do it. Jesus immediately was moved with compassion, reached out and touched him and said, I will, and his leprosy was cleansed. Here in John chapter 9, we see that Jesus, again, it seems to be initiated on his part. The blind man didn't come to him. There were many other blind people that came to him, and we have records of their healing. But in this case, we don't have any indication whatsoever that she made the first move to him, or that he made the first move toward Jesus but rather the other way around where Jesus made a move toward him. Here's one in Mark chapter 5 that's initiated solely on the part of the individual. A certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all she had and was nothing better but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue or power had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Again, Jesus doesn't have to interview this woman to find out if she's living in sin. He doesn't ask any questions of her, primarily because he's not the one initiating it. She initiates it. She initiates it. It doesn't indicate to us in any way whatsoever, any credible way whatsoever, that Jesus even knew that she was going to come. It doesn't indicate to us that as Jesus is interrupting his visit to Jairus' house, he doesn't start walking slow and whisper to one of his disciples, if you see a lady in a multicolored coat, let me know. It's not like he's been directed by God before maybe when he was praying in in the night before, previous, that God revealed to him that she was coming, we'd have to change the scripture to come up with any, uh, any ideas or theories like that. This was something that because of what she heard about Jesus, she had to heal that he was healing people by touch because that's what she had faith for. Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. So she had to have heard that Jesus was healing because she had faith to be healed. And she must have heard that Jesus was healing by touch, whether it's the touch of his garment or him reaching out and touching people himself, laying hands on folks. That part we don't know. It's possible there were other occasions in Jesus' ministry where people were healed by touching his garment. So maybe she heard about that and maybe that's all she heard about and that's where she put her faith. But whatever it was prompted her to take action with an expectancy to receive. Now, the thing about this story that I find interesting, an interesting point, maybe the most interesting point, is that the disciples answered Jesus when he said, who touched me? The disciples answered and said, basically, everybody's touching you. The multitude throngeth thee. What are people, that means everybody on every hand from every direction are trying to get close enough to Jesus, pushing and shoving Looks like a Black Friday open at the, at the mall. Everybody's scrambling, trying to get to a certain place. Well, in Jesus' case, they were scrambling, trying to get close enough to him to touch them. For them to touch Jesus. Why? Could it be that they heard some of the th- same things Jesus said? Or that the woman with the issue of blood had heard about him? The physical touch then wasn't the the key ingredient. Couldn't have been. Because she touched him differently than anybody else in that throng, that multitude that was thronging him. 
She touched him differently than anybody else ever had or did on that occasion. I'm sure a lot of people that reached out and touched Jesus were reaching out to see what they would get if they did make contact with him. I'm sure that everybody that reached out to touch Jesus wanted something significant from him, but only one person got anything because only one person reached out and touched him in faith. Only one. Now, I don't know how big the crowd was, but it's called a multitude. That indicates a pretty large group, doesn't it? And yet she's the only one that received anything because of what she believed when she touched him. Because of what she believed when she touched him. When Jesus gets the story from her, he responds in verse 34, daughter, your faith has made you whole. Now, I would submit to you that the power of God made her whole. She felt power going into her body. Jesus felt power leaving his body. So without dispute, we have to understand that the healing power of God is what changed her body and what ended that flow of blood, that issue of blood. Then why did Jesus credit her faith? Because it was faith and only faith that activated the power. That's what made it different. That's what made her touching Jesus different from anybody else that was in the multitude thronging him. She believed something when she touched him. Nobody else did. Nobody in that multitude did. Except for her. Now folks, if this is instructive for us. And I'm not saying this is what, this is what it means. But I want you to consider something. If the healing ministry of Jesus is complete for example John said that if everything Jesus said and did was written down the world itself couldn't contain the books well then that has to mean there were more cases of healing than what we just have record of the Bible tells us of 19 individual cases of healing or 19 healing events doesn't count the, the 10 lepers for example or groups of people where the whole multitudes were healed or anything like that but there were 19 individual cases of healing in the four gospels Of those 19 individual cases, about 75% of them either specifically identified the faith of the individual or implied through their actions that faith was present. But out of this whole multitude, there was only one person that reached out and touched him in faith. I sure hope that percentage is not assigned to us as to how the modern day church will be. Of all the multitudes that are caught up in their thinking or their ideas about what God can or can't do or will or won't do, there was one that reached out and touched him in faith. Smith Wilkersworth said, it seems that God will pass over a million people to get to one person standing in faith. I believe he's exactly right. Because faith is the necessary ingredient to receive from God. God's looking for people in faith. And that's why, in my opinion, that's why Jesus stopped. He could have just said, well, I felt somebody get something there and keep walking. But Jesus always magnified the faith of the individual when it was in operation. He always magnified the faith of the people that either said something that identified what they believed or did something that identified that they believed. He always made a big deal of that. I believe the reason is simple and it's obvious because it's God's will for all of us to operate in faith and take hold of what belongs to us through the sacrificial work of Jesus. And that's exactly what this story portrays. If Jesus was here today, a lot of people would say, oh, if he was just here today where I could reach out and touch him, 99% of those people wouldn't get anything because they wouldn't be touching him in faith. See, when the word says God sent his word and healed us, that negates any need for Jesus to come back in the flesh or appear to us in any way whatsoever to provide what he's already purchased through his own precious blood. Simply put, folks, if you can't believe the word that he gave to us to take hold of healing, 
you wouldn't be healed if he showed up. Because Jesus is the Word made flesh. God and his Word are one. Daughter, your faith has made you whole. Your faith activated the power of God where everybody else's touch did not. But she touched him in faith. He's still able to be touched. He's able to be touched through the confession of our mouths. To believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. To believe with our hearts that Jesus took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. And to speak God's word always brings us in contact with him. Let's all stand. Let's lift our hands and thank God for his healing mercy. Father, we bless your holy name. We thank you that just as the woman in Luke 13 that was bowed over with the spirit of infirmity... Just as you said she ought to be healed because she's a daughter of Abraham and Satan was the one binding her. In the same way, we believe that we should be healed. And therefore, we thank you for your attitude towards sickness and disease. We thank you for your willingness to heal each and every one of your children. So we reach out with the hand of faith. We believe that you took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. And with your stripes, we are healed. We believe that healing is ours. So we call ourselves healed. We speak those things which are not as though they were. And we say that we're healed from the top of our head to the soles of our feet. Jesus, you said, whosoever, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them. We desire a well body. So we say in faith, we believe we receive our healing. Thank you, Father, that the prayer of faith heals the sick. The prayer of faith has healed us. And you, Lord, are raising us up. We bless your holy name, Father. We thank you for being so good to us. In Jesus' name, if you can agree with that, say amen. 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 Hallelujah. Well, have a great week. Come back and be with us Thursday night for our midweek service as you can. And we'll see you next time we're able. <laughs>